Welcome everyone to Shaper Sessions. My name is Jake. And I'm Russ. And we have a very fun show today. One of my personal favorite topics, inlay and marketry. Yeah, love that. Um, today we're going to talk about inlay and marketry. Two kind of different styles, a lot of overlap though. <laughs> we're going to talk about what each of those means. Um, and we're going to cut a project from start to finish all in this one show. We slowed it way down in the last couple of shows. Today we're going to speed it back up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to show you some cool projects from other folks that you might want to take a look at. Uh, we've also got some really good tips, not just from us, but also from our buddy Ramon Valdez, marketry mega pro, yeah. I'm going to call him. Uh, so we've got some tips from him halfway through the show. So stay tuned for that. Um, if you're joining us for your first session, here's the format. This is live. We're doing live demos of Shaper Origin and teaching you how it works as we go. There is a chat box to the side of the screen. In that chat box, you can type questions. Those questions, Ted will answer probably a lot of them during the show. He's good at that. But any questions that Ted thinks we should do a demo of, he's going to send those to us, and we'll do that demo at the end of the show. And then also during that Q&A segment, we do a giveaway. Giveaways. So to enter that, how do we enter the giveaway? You are going to answer that poll question, which today is, just so you can ruminate on it a little bit, where do you go to learn about new woodworking skills? Yeah. Is it us? We'd be flattered. It doesn't have to be us, though. It could be like magazines. It could be in-person events. It could be a specific website. Maybe it's YouTube in general. Uh, think about the answer to that. That poll question is going to pop up about halfway through the show. When we do shaper announcements, you'll have a minute to answer that. And then when you respond to that, you're going to be entered into that giveaway at the end of the show. And that's for everybody who's watching live today. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're watching this on demand, make sure you join us next time for Shaper Sessions live every other Thursday. Um, we haven't done this in a while. I'm going to say, like, without further ado, we should just go ahead and cut some stuff. Let's just get in it. We um, have uh, a few pieces to cut, a few positive pieces to cut. I'm going to rip through the first one, and then we're going to go back into it in a little bit more detail. Yeah, so we're going to kind of breeze through the setup here. Uh, we want to talk about Shaper Origin in general and how it relates to inlay and marquetry. Then we'll go into breaking down the details of what all this setup actually takes, how you go through it and do it step by step so that you can follow along. Um, but first, we just kind of want to get everybody up to speed, uh, if you're new, on what Origin is and how it works. And I can kind of talk through that while Jake is cutting these inlay parts out. What do you think, Jake? Perfect. Okay. Tight. So we can switch over, to the, uh, switch over to the Origin cam here. We can just see what Jake's looking at. Um, this is Origin's workspace. It's a handheld CNC router for woodworking. It works with this big image map that we drop digital templates onto. Jake is, you're setting up auto pass there, right? Is that what you were doing? I am, I'm just doing one depth pass followed by a finish pass. We can talk a little bit more about that while you're cutting, uh, but I don't wanna hold you up. Let's let it rip. How many pieces are you cutting out in total? I'll go ahead and zoom out just so you can see. I have three pieces that come together to make one, I'm gonna call it a horseshoe or a squirrel. A squirrel. A squir scroll. <laughs> a scroll. You can vote. Is this a horseshoe, a scroll, or a squirrel? Here's what we're working on today. It's this inlay. Uh, kind of like Mediterranean vibes, you were saying? Yeah. It I mean, looks that's the vibe. Vaguely gives. Grecian, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, cool. So we're cutting out one set of these inlay parts. And again, we're going to cut one set now. We're going to talk about origin while Jake's cutting. And then we're going to go through all of the setup for this. Yep. To walk you through how you could do this at home okay cool well i'll just let you get to it how about all right that? i have that eighth inch bit in there and i'm running speed five nice once again welcome everybody to shaper sessions this is our bi-weekly live stream where we show you how to use shaper origin for projects in your shop uh, or even out of your shop on site, as the case may be, because it's a great portable tool. Um, and today we're doing inlay and marquetry. Now, to catch anybody up who's seeing Origin for the first time here, because I know I met a lot of new people at a trade show recently and we get new visitors every time we do one of these, Shaper Origin 
is a handheld CNC machine for woodworking and more, frankly, not just wood, but alternate materials like plastics and soft metals as well, um, which uses a modest corrective range to keep you on track as you move this kind of plunge router shaped CNC machine around your workspace. So all you need to do is get the machine close and it'll be always automatically compensating or correcting for you in real time to keep you right on the path. And the way that you see this as Jake is cutting out these parts is with the kind of three combined features of the crosshairs, the dot, and the circle. Uh, the circle represents that total corrective range that we want to keep origin in. Uh, the dot represents actually the center of the spindle, which is tracking exactly to the toolpath line that Jake is following. Origin calculates all this stuff automatically for you really easily based on just a few really conversational inputs, and we'll go through all of those uh, as we set up the next inlay a little bit later on in the show. And the crosshairs kind of represent your target, although you can stick anywhere inside that circle and Origin is really going to keep you exactly on track. The whole circular range is as accurate as anywhere else in there. We say you want to move smoothly, um, really though anywhere in the circle is just fine. Now the real magic of this is if you go outside the circle, Origin will automatically retract and save your work for you. Okay, so Jake went outside the circle there. Origin says, hey, I can't correct for this anymore. I'm gonna automatically retract, stop you from cutting so that you don't mess up your work, which is really magical. Like a plunge router is not gonna do that for you. A uh, plunge router is gonna eat through your work and chew up your template while you're at it. So uh, that's one of the really, really cool things about Shaper Origin. Uh, it's super precise as you're gonna see in this show today. It's really great for detailed stuff like this inlay project. We have some even more detailed inlay projects that we're going to show you today from some of our uh, friends around the country. And the cool thing about it is that it can be really easy to learn. And so hopefully by just watching this show, you'll be able to take home some skills and do an inlay like this in your shop. Alrighty. Nice. Those so, parts look good. Yeah, they do. That uh, that was pretty quick. Again, only two passes. Um, with a zero inch offset. And when I'm mm -hmm. mulling over in my head right now, if I want to put a negative offset there, before I pop it off, that might help thing comes to, things come together in the final. You want to do it? I think I should do it. We can just talk about how easy it is to kind of tweak this stuff as you go, too, yeah. you know, because that's a really valuable thing. And we're kind of skipping ahead here because we're adding an offset, which is kind of a complex feature. Right here at the top of the show, we're going to do the same thing here again in about 20 minutes when we get to cutting the second set of these with a little more explanation. But for now, just follow along that Jake is adding a negative offset, which is going to remove just a bit extra material at the end of this. And that's to help this all come together easily. You can add those offsets at any time and we'll show you how to do this. Um, one of the nice things about Origin is that you can tweak these fits so, uh, you know, as opposed to a template on your plunge router where you're kind of stuck with the fit you have. With this it's really easy to adjust. Um, one of the downsides <laughs> of doing these live shows is that, you know, you want stuff to go together easily for the camera, but you're never really sure until the end about how it's going to go. So we tend to err on the side of caution occasionally. But there you go. It's easy to return right to those lines and zip that out. Sorry, curveball there. That's okay. That's what we're here for. That's how you know it's live, everybody. Got my flexible putty knife, which is absolutely essential 
for working with this thin stock. Because you can wiggle it under there, under that double-sided tape, and really gingerly pop up your piece. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so, okay, we just cut out some inlay parts, just gave you a little bit of background on origin. Jake's going to peel this stuff up. Um, after that, we'll get set up and cut more of these. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk about inlay and marquetry in general. Um, pop quiz, what's the difference between inlay and marquetry? All right, I'm going to say marquetry is the art of making kind of an image, a standalone image uh -huh. out of wood uh -huh. inlay is where you just take pieces and put it into another piece. Marquetry, you would say, is more like on top. Inlay is more into. Yeah. Yeah. I like you could that inlay idea. a piece of marquetry. Mm, interesting. That's my, that's my thought. I think marquetry just sounds fancier, and so I'm going to use it for everything. <laughs> it's all when you want to charge more for your project, call it marquetry. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> um, Regardless of that, we have kind of two categories of inlay or marquetry that we're talking about today. And those have to do with thickness of the material that you're using. So today we're using relatively thick shop sawn veneer. And how thick did you make this stuff, Jake? This is 0.177, so just a little over an eighth of an inch. Yeah, that's pretty thick. Okay, cool. So a little over an eighth of an inch for this one. Um, Thinner inlays can go down to as thin as 1 42nd of an inch, which is a weird fraction. But the easy way to remember that is that it's about 0 0.02 inches or a half a millimeter. Uh, I think that was a metric measurement originally because a half a millimeter is yeah. really easy to remember. And, and then they just second. fractionized it, <laughs> right? Let's fractionize that for the U.S. folks. Um, so we have kind of two categories. We have these thicker shops on veneers, and we have thinner commercial veneers. Uh, and different advantages and disadvantages to each. So today we're working with shops on veneers. The nice thing about this is that you can make them whatever thickness you want within the capability of the tools in your shop. And so I would say the range on that is going to be anywhere from like a quarter inch on the thick side to a 16th inch on the thin side. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, if you're making it yourself and you're using a drum sander and a pants mm -hmm. on a drum sander kind of thing. Yeah, and the trade-offs with thickness there are that the thicker you go, the more durable your inlay is gonna be, the longer, the more times you could sand it, for yeah. example. And that's gonna be really important for when you're doing something like a flooring inlay. The downside to that is that the parts are gonna be harder to cut small corners into mm -hmm. because to get a sharp corner, you want a really small diameter router bit. And really small diameter router bits simply don't reach that long. We have some really small diameter router bits that only reach, let's say, a 16th of an inch for a 132nd router bit. Uh, this is an eighth inch router bit, which you could reach up to about a half inch in reliably. Yeah. So we can go thicker with this because the router bit, the sharpness of the corner that we're using, is a bigger diameter. Um, the other trade off is that the thicker you go, the more force this wood expanding and contracting is going to exert on your project. The thinner you go, the more stable it is, kind of like plywood. The thicker you go, the more this wood has the ability to affect the rest of your piece. Um, never heard of an inlay splitting something like a tabletop, you know? But you would hate to it. get warping from something like, ja something like that, from yeah. expansion in a different direction. Yeah. So... Think about your thickness. Typically here we're doing eighth of an inch just because it feels it's nice and easy. Mm -hmm. It's stable too, you know, when we're prying it up, it's not gonna it's less likely to split on us. Mm -hmm. Um you still want to be cautious of what direction the grain is going and everything. Yep. But that's where the putty knife comes in. Totally. And then going on the extreme end of the spectrum, we have commercial veneers, that half millimeter thick veneer. Yeah. Um we've got some tips from Ramon coming in in a minute on that, but as a baseline why would you use thin veneers? They're so much harder to work with. Well, you have a much wider range of veneers that you have available to you then. Uh, you can responsibly use more exotic woods if you're using less or thinner amounts of them. Uh, you have a lot of different colors that are commercially available than you would be able to make in your shop. Um, and it can be less expensive as well. So Yeah, and it's totally possible there. with Origin. It's totally possible with Origin also. So we'll show you more on that in a minute. Um, 
The other thing kind of categorically that's important to think about for working with veneers or doing inlay and marquetry is your router bit. So today we're working with an eighth inch up spiral router bit. Um, and that basically means two things. Eighth inch means that there's a certain minimum uh, corner radius that we need to have in all of our parts for that eight inch router bit to reach inside. And we can show that again on the camera over there. So that eighth inch router bit needs to fit inside that corner. Uh, the other thing with that up spiral is that, you know, an up spiral evacuates the sawdust really well. It spirals up and out and pulls the sawdust up and out of the cut. The trade-off there is that sometimes it can leave a little bit of a fuzz on the corner of your parts. And you can see we've got a little bit of fuzz right there. That's what I'm talking about. There are other types of router bits called straight router bits or down spiral router bits. Straight router bits literally have a straight edge going vertically, so they shear straight off to the side. Down spiral router bits have a spiral that goes down and actually pushes those fuzzes down into the cut and is gonna leave you a cleaner top edge. Um, the downside with that as you get to thicker material is that the down spiral router bits tend to jam up the cut with sawdust as you get to thicker material. So since we're working with something as thick as even thicker than an eighth inch stock, mm -hmm. we're going to stick with an up spiral router bit on this one. Uh, the reasons for that are so that we can evacuate those chips. We're going to get a cleaner cut. The trade-off being that we have some fuzz, but since we have such thick stock, that's going to be really easy to clean up. Yeah, just super easy with a sanding stick to knock the fuzz off. Um, but it would be really hard to clean that up with like imagine half millimeter stock right oh yeah it's like your you're, hands. you're losing the entire cut basically at that point mm -hmm. so um that's something to think about there as well i'm looking over at my notes here we covered the thickness range we covered the types of router bits and what's important there um i think we're ready to go into the origin setup for yeah. this. so underneath this board here i don't know if we'll catch it in the overhead or this works yeah this is my shelf. It's my normal shelf underneath here, and I've just double stick taped a larger, hey, look at that, that did come in handy, uh, a larger piece of MDF spoil board on top of that to give me more space to stick this down to, because I'm cutting pieces out of the entire thing. Goose uh, is laughing up there, dude. <laughs> we told Goose at the beginning of the show we're never gonna use that underside view. Go ahead and pull that up again, Goose. There you go. <laughs> there we go. So you can see those two shelves stuck to each other. That's awesome. Just with double-sided tape. Alternatively, you can actually make another one of these um, with the screw holes and everything. But That's yeah. simply bigger, and we have those screw hole patterns available online or in your workstation manual. Yeah. Um, then we're going to use some double-sided tape, which I think we should give a, a roll away today because this is one of the saviors of this project. It totally is. We'll do that. And when you're working with thinner stock, I like to be quite generous with my double-sided tape because I want these things to stay down. Mm -hmm. The thinner stock doesn't transfer the load as well. Thicker stock, it could be taped over here, but it's going to be nice and stiff if you cut it somewhere else. This stuff, if you have tape on one side and you're trying to cut on the other end of the part, it's going to be all vibrating and wobbly. So you don't want that. You want a nice, good stick all the way across. And I am sticking this down with about a quarter of an inch away from my aluminum clamping face so that there's room for the bit to come around because the way I've nested these files comes pretty close to the edge of this board. Nice. I'm going to go ahead and scan it in. So we're starting completely from scratch with a new scan. The way that we work with Origin is scan, design, cut. We're starting from the top down. So the first step when you're starting a new project typically is to scan. This is making that image map of the whole workspace. There we go. And like I said, the, the pieces are quite tight on this board. I had this size maple, so I nested them mm -hmm. to fit on this board. Um, which you can do in studio if you just want to download this project, bring it into studio, and kind of rearrange how they fit on a board. Oh, that's convenient. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so what you're doing now is you're going to make a grid so that you can align this well-nested design space to this particular size wood cutout that you have. Exactly. So if you remember from our previous shows, gridding is a really easy way to get reliable position relative to axes and a coordinate point. Uh, we're making those axes by probing against the workpiece, either with a solid probe like your engraving bit upside down, or if you're saving a little time as we are today, uh, just with the router bit, it's a little bit less precise, but it does allow you still to align things and return to them in a way that is still meaningful. So. Yeah. Yeah, in my case, plus or minus a, a smidge is okay. Yeah, totally okay. You're not aligning a tenon, for example. Exactly. Right? Uh, I'm going to hop over into import, and I'm going to grab my maple using that bottom left anchor point, because that's where I made my grid, po grid point. Drop it right there. And you can see as I zoom in how close I am to that edge. Mm -hmm. just to make the most out of out of this material and to make sure that the grain is running in a certain direction. Yeah. Cool. So now before we get to cutting, we have two things that I want to show you. One is this idea of scaling, because you brought this up before the show, and I thought this was super cool. Like, this is a wall-hanging piece, you know? You might put this... Small side table. In a door or, like, in an entryway. I think that could be cool. But you were thinking, like, what if you turn this into a big, I even picture this outdoors, like a big, round, communal tabletop. Mm -hmm. I think that's so cool. And one of the cool things about Origin is it makes it really easy for you to scale projects depending on what size you're wanting to work with, right? Yeah. And so we can do that really easily on Tool with uh, the Copy button or by importing the project again. Let's go ahead and copy it. So I have another version up here right above it. And I'm going to grab it from the middle. But on your left-hand side, you're going to see that scale button. And it's going to give you the width and height. And currently, those two are linked together. Yeah, see what that does if, that, if you press that button. It's going to unlink those two. And it's going to let you change those independently. But for this, you want them to be linked so they keep that proportion. Exactly. Um, and it's funny. Before you brought this up, I had never thought about using, like, I would just adjust the number. Oh, yeah. But we're going to use a multiple. Yeah, we're going to use a multiplier. So we have 19 point da 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 times. Let's go four. Let's go with four. Done. Bam. Now it's 36 inches wide, 76 inches wide. Mm -hmm. And as long as we use that same multiplier for the pocket file. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the parts. And the rest of the parts. It's all going to come together. You're going to be good. So let's say this is... I mean, I don't know, what is this, like a foot and a half or something like that? So if you wanted a six-foot tabletop, you would go ahead and multiply by four. There you go. I just want to see what this looks like when we scale it up like that. This is the pocket shape, and it's 16 inches wide. I'm going to multiply it by four. Yeah, it's going to feel pretty big. 64-inch diameter table. Yeah, solid. Nice. I've got a new project this summer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming soon, big Mediterranean outdoor tabletop by Russ on Shaper Sessions. All right. Cool. So, okay. So we're going to stick a pin in this. We just showed you guys how to set this all up. Before we get too far away from material thicknesses, mm -hmm. Goose, this is your key to queue up the video. We have a video coming in from Ramon Valdez. Ramon is a marquetry hyper pro. I'm yeah. going to come up with a different adjective for this every time. Right now, he's the hyper pro on inlay and marquetry. Um, he watches a ton of sessions, so shout out to Ramon. We did a previous session with him on specifically thin veneer. Uh, that was session number 50-something, which was a long time ago, but Ted has the link to that. He's going to drop that in the chat. And Ramon sent us a short video on some thin veneer tips. So let's pull that up and play it. Thanks, Ramon. Hello, I'm Ramon Valdez. I've got a few marketry tips as they relate to working with the Shaper Origin and a few tips when working with different thicknesses of veneer. Check it out. Whenever I'm cutting veneers with the Shaper Origin, I always use a down cut spiral. It doesn't matter if it's an eighth inch or all the way down to this tiny little dude, which is one thirty second of an inch. Down cut spiral is going to keep those fibers from uh, lifting and fraying, and it'll also hold the material down because Sometimes this can be quite thin. 
This is raw veneer and it's quite thin at about 1 42nd of an inch or half a millimeter. But I love this because the palette is huge. Since it's commercially available, you can find all different colors and species. Of course, if you slice your own, you can dictate how thick you want that material. Here I've got some that's 1 16th of an inch or 1.5 millimeter. And that is awesome because it's a little bit more substantial. When I'm using this thin commercial veneer, I work at this table that I've set up. And essentially it's two layers of eighth inch MDF, right? With a layer of this in between them. And I've bonded it with some spray adhesive. Then I have a layer of quarter inch, which matches this height when this one is in place. And that way this area and this area, these two are areas are flush to each other, right? That's what you need with the Shaper Origin. So here's an awesome yet essential tip. When I'm adhering this to my wasteboard, I don't use tape. You can imagine what kind of a mess that would make. I'm using this, it's called Easy Tack. It's basically a repositionable adhesive and I can spray just the substrate. You don't wanna spray both sides. Just spray this, shield that so you don't get overspray on that. Let it tack up for a couple minutes, put it in place and secure it with like a metal roller, right? And that'll hold just enough to where you can make your cuts and then you can take one of these painter spatulas, they're really thin, and you can get underneath those edges and easily pull those loose, usually. <laughs> and it doesn't take much, don't, don't put too much. The easiest, fastest, and absolute best way I've ever found to cut veneers, whether it's cross grain or with the grain, thin or shop sawn, is with what I call a veneer sled. It's basically a cross cut sled. You can see the blade is just gonna be slightly higher, slightly proud of the veneer. You can put this veneer in place. I've got sandpaper on here for better gription, right? Secure it like that, put a sacrificial board, some scrap, and put it over the top. And you can just run that through and you will get glue ready seams straight away, right off the table saw. Works incredibly well. This larger veneer sled, it works the same way, but I can add clamps to hold things down. It also has a safety box at the end, which also serves as a dust port for the shop vac. Here we'll run two at a time. We can just put those right over the kerf, add a sacrificial board and bam, run them through. I like to create these little tape tabs as I pull the tape from the roll. It just makes it so much easier to pull the tape loose once the glue dries. So here I'm pulling the two pieces together, no glue at this point. One piece all the way across, roll that down, make sure the two pieces are flush. Now we add plenty of glue. We'll wipe off the excess. I use a wet rag to get most of it off and then start pulling tape across that seam. Sometimes I'll just get all my tape ready, that way it reduces panic whilst you're trying to get all those pieces flush. Easy as that, that'll make a beautiful seam and in as little as 20 minutes we can pull the tape. This motif was created with a Shaper Origin. I have to give credit to Sean and some of the other guys with Shaper Origin. It was made as a large barn door for a client at 51 by 90 inches, and we all learned a ton. Anyway, that's it. Gotta love the Shaper Origin. Boundless potential. Incredible. <laughs> Thank you, Ramon. Incredible. I love, I mean, you couldn't tell how huge that barn door was it's until they saw somebody standing next to it. So yeah. that's... Just an absolutely insane project. Yeah. Um, big shout out to Ramon. That's at Ramon Artful on Instagram. And Ted's got a link to his YouTube channel and website in the chat as well. Um, cool. And again, also before we dive into cutting this stuff, I think this would be a good time to do some announcements and pull up that poll question. Yes, what do you think? I think it is. Okay. Uh, so reminder, we're doing the giveaway at the end of the show. To enter that giveaway, you... Tell us where you go to learn stuff. Absolutely. So we're curious where you go to learn new woodworking skills specifically. So Goose, we got that poll question up. Goose says yes. Okay, perfect. So in the meantime, a couple of announcements. Some of these you may have heard before, but I think it's worth rehashing. Um, number one, especially because we've got Frank Straza at our Masterclass Live event in Florida, and we are talking about inlay and marquetry 
Talk about another marketry expert. You should check out Frank's workbenches. They are insane. And if you don't want to miss the next Masterclass Live, which I think we're planning on hosting in San Francisco again, right? Probably in the fall love sometime. It. Yeah, love that. If you want to find out about the next Masterclass Live and you want to be the first person notified, you are going to go to shapertools.com slash masterclass hyphen live. Let's pull that up on the laptop here. So this is Woodworking Masterclass Live. Unfortunately, the one that we're doing next weekend in Florida is sold out. But if you want to get on that notifications list for future masterclasses, just click this Get On Wait List button, and that's going to allow you to drop your email address in there, and you will be the first person to know when we do our next Masterclass Live event in San Francisco. And that'll probably be this fall sometime. Sweet. Perfect. That's one. Um, number two, box challenge, box challenge, box yeah. challenge, box challenge. So the box challenge is wrapped. Uh, we are judging the results right now Yep. and we are going to announce the winners next session, next we, session. We were going to do it this session, but we are all just a little too busy. So we're going to build the anticipation a little bit more. And we but had a lot of submissions. We did. Yeah. So it's going to take some time to sort through those. We did our first round. We kind of scraped it down to the first round, and we're going to do some uh, more in-depth, maybe group judging yeah. uh, in the next week or so. But, but some truly incredible uh, boxes came through this this year. I was really excited to see. So. Yeah, love that. So we're going to announce those winners on our next session, March 21st. Also, March 21st, we're going to have Leia Amick on here. You're going to get the inside scoop on this. We have not dropped this project yet, but Leia just wrapped another project for us. It's a wall accessory mm -hmm. that solves the problem of the clothes chair. <laughs> Everybody knows the clothes chair, right? You put something that you've worn once. Uh, hey, what do I do with this? I can't quite put it away, but it's not ready for the dirty laundry yet. Um, this is a really cool, flexible... A ladder shaped object that hangs on your wall not and for it's climbing. got not you I mean yeah, you could maybe climb on it yeah <laughs> it's got some really cool joinery with origin she came up with some really incredible stuff we're going to launch that in the next week or so and to learn more about that project you're definitely going to want to watch our session on march 21st that's going to be very exciting that's coming up and um since we're talking about the box challenge and we're talking about inlay goose this is your cue we got another video coming up I wanted to show you guys another really cool inlay project from Eric Curtis. This was a box challenge entry, and it just blew me away. He's also going to be one of our instructors in Florida for the Masterclass. We really picked cool. right for that, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and play this Eric Curtis video of this sweet box inlay. How cool is that? <laughs> oh, it's so cool. Um, and there was a really interesting technique in there. Uh, you might want to go back and watch this again after the end of the show. What we're going to show you today is pocketing with Origin, and that's removing all this material that you need to set the inlay into with Origin. But what Eric did there is to save a little bit of time, I think. Um, he has a lot of routers at his disposal, right? So he did just the outline with Origin and then came in and did the mass material removal in that pocket carefully. Now, mind you, you gotta be really careful with this, with a trim router, with a big base on it, a big mm -hmm. flat base. Yeah. So I thought that was a cool technique, wanted to share that as well.
Very cool. I got to talk to him about this finish, too. You said it was a soap finish? It was a soap finish. Heard of it. Never tried it. He's got a whole YouTube video on that. So check out his Instagram. That's at E-N Curtis. And then he's also got a YouTube channel where you can see, like, it's like a 20-minute video on that box build. And then he's got that video on the soap finish also that you're going to want to watch, Jake. Going to go watch that. Check him out. Check that stuff out. Last announcement is that we just launched a new update to the hardware catalog. Your your pride and joy. My pride and joy. My baby. (laughs) The hardware catalog, if you're not aware, is where we keep a bunch, uh, over 200 templates now, uh, a bunch of digital templates free for all of our customers. You don't need to pay anything um, for the most popular and impactful precision woodworking hardware out there. And I was just at the Kitchen and Bath Industry Show in Las Vegas with Sugatsuni. Uh, They make these really beautiful architectural hinges along with some other hardware. So let me show you what we added to the Shaper Hub hardware catalog here. Again, this is the hardware catalog where you can browse through and see all different kinds of hardware on here. We've got concealed hinges. We've got hooks. If we look at what was added, we've got a bunch of stuff from two brands. First off, we've got Festool Dominoes, which is really convenient. I'll tell you why in a minute. And then we've also got Sugatsuni products. So if we look at that, you can see that we've got these crazy Sugatsuni concealed hinges. If you've ever installed a sauce hinge and wished it was a little bit adjustable, that's what these hinges do, especially this HES 3D70. That's a three-way adjustable cabinet size hinge, and it's really easy now to install this stuff with Origin, um, along with a bunch of mortised hooks, which are really nice for like built-in wardrobes and cabinetry, or even a boat build, I think these would be perfect for, because yeah. they just pop right into the wall. And then we also added all the standard Festool domino sizes. And, you know, why would you want to use Origin for this when you've got a domino joiner? Well, okay, maybe you don't have a domino joiner, but you want to join stuff with dominoes, which is like one super good reason. The other good reason might be there are some things that a domino joiner is hard to use for, like putting dominoes in the middle of a panel. You ever do that? That's a really hard one for me. Yeah, it's tricky. So I would consider using Origin and Plate for that. Maybe it could be cool. Mm -hmm. So check those out okay nice. i think it's time to pull down the poll question take a deep breath because we're about to get into cutting yes <laughs> that's enough cutting. announcements for now all right so we're going to do the same cut we did before but now you have a little bit of bit of a better of an understanding of the setup um, yeah a little bit of context and we can talk through more now all the cut settings that we kind of glossed over the first time that we did this all right so i'm hovering over my first line Going down to 0.18, that's just slightly deeper than my material. Everything's an outside cut here. This is what we call our global offset. That's at zero, so we're cutting it true to size. Eighth inch bit, and when I open up my auto pass settings, it's going to do two of the same depth passes, but that first one has a roughing offset of 0.013. Cool. So auto pass is going to automatically do that first pass and then bring you into that finished pass at your global offset, which is zero, which is true to size. Exactly. One last thing I'd like to mention is speeds, because I saw you using auto mode in the corners a little bit to get some super sharp corners. Mm -hmm. So let's pop into speeds. Uh, I'm guessing you're just on the defaults here. I am on just the defaults. Yeah, perfect. I I find that's generally just fine. Pretty good for woods. Um, And I'm kind of cruising through this one because it's... uh, thin material Mm -hmm. um relatively new bit so it's nice and sharp Mm -hmm. um but i'll always slow down in the corners that's that's the biggest thing if i'm cruising on my roughing pass going pretty fast um just make sure that you slow yourself down when you're approaching those hard hard turns because it's a big fast direction change origin does best with smoothness yeah smoothness and grace okay let's see how graceful you can (laughs) race it (laughs) yeah let's go cool nice so we talked you through the setup on that one um last thing to note about this is that you can find this project on shaper hub so you might think uh hey you know you just imported this where did you import this from um i'll show you a couple projects on shaper hub toward the end of the show after we get this pocket all cut and fit together Uh, We've got this project, we've got another thin 
marquetry project from Ramon, which is a really cool shiprock inlay, shiprock New Mexico. And we have a sweet feather parquetry project uh, from Michael Burt. And Michael Burt, noteworthy because he just taught a intro to origin class at the Florida School of Work, actually independently of us. So speaking of places where you might learn more about origin, you know, we've got sessions every other week. We have this masterclass live series that we're doing. We've got don't forget the masterclass video series permanently hosted on our website at shapertools.com slash masterclass, where you can learn more about specific applications with Origin from people like Matt Kenny, uh, 52 Boxes in 52 Weeks, for example. But we also have a whole network of folks who are teaching classes on Origin at these woodworking schools across the country. So shout out to Michael for teaching that Origin class at the Florida School of Woodwork. So Jake's cruising through these on AutoPass. Um, a little bit of context about AutoPass. You know, you could do this stuff where you do a roughing pass, what we call it, with a global offset, and then change that global offset to do a finishing pass. But what AutoPass does, which is really nice for you, is it saves you a lot of time and automates that step. So there's less of a chance of mashing your fingers into the wrong button accidentally, which happens even to the best of us. Um, so AutoPass is a one-time paid extension, and it does two main things. It allows you to set a final depth that you can go down to in steps, and it allows you to set a automatic roughing pass. So when you set that depth, um, AutoPass is going to calculate automatically a number of steps that it's going to take to get down to that final depth. In this case, Jake is going just down to that one final depth in one step because it's pretty thin material. Uh, but if he were doing, let's say, quarter inch thick material with this eighth inch router bit, he might want to do that in two depth passes. And rather than pausing between each and changing the depth manually, AutoPass just ramps down between bits, uh, completely, or between depths completely automatically. And then what you just saw there was AutoPass ramping into this finish pass. So we like to do roughing passes and then finishing passes. The finishing passes here are typically much smaller cuts. Uh, they remove less material so that uh, you can be as smooth as possible with that final result. And AutoPass is going to automatically ramp you from that roughing offset to your finishing pass, your zero offset, or whatever your global offset is set to is what it's going to go into at the end of the day. Um, and you can see Jake just changing that global offset there to zing just a little bit off the ends of each of these pieces. And I think that's going to help it come together a little bit better for, for television, for television's sake. Nice. Nice. Um, we touched on this in the past, but that little kind of selective cut that I was doing just on the ends of those pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was about to mention that, but then you went through them so quickly. So I'll just do an air cut. In order to make it snap right to that corner, right to that, 90, that, that turnaround, I'm biasing my corrective range on the outside so that when I plunge, it snaps to that corner. And it, same thing for this. Yep, it's going to snap and kind of stay stuck to the closest point. So you want to be on the outside of that corner and for, make sure for the start and end point that that corner is your closest point to the center of your window. Versus if I'm biased inwards like this and I come up to my stop, it's going to want to help itself and go around. It's going to snap around to the closest point because the closest point isn't the corner anymore. So that's how you can kind of tweak things independently, even if it's just all in the same file. Mm-hmm. Cool tip. All right. Yeah, let's peel this up. 
All right, so we have all of our inlay parts cut. Um, when we're working with Origin, we cut the positive first and the negative second. That goes for inlay pieces, where we cut the positive inlay piece first, and then the pocket second. That also goes for mortise and tenons, where we cut the tenons first and the mortises second. Um, just because that's what's typically easier to adjust. The negative's typically easier to adjust, and it's easier to bring the positive pieces to the negative with Origin. Uh, although when you're working with hand tools, it can be easier the opposite way around. So that's something to kind of wrap your head around. But whenever you're thinking about it, just think about positive first. Here, I can go ahead and peel up some tape. Thank you. Okay, gotcha. What I also do um, on all my parts, just so I don't get confused down the road, is I do a little X on the back of each mm, component awesome. so I know which side goes down in the pocket. That's a great idea. Especially when you get to more complex shapes. So you, you have a harder time telling which way is up. X marks the spot. X marks the spot. I think I took my pencil out for the show. There we go. Cool. Solid. You got that? Here, I'll give you this. I got some quick defuzzing to do. I can defuzz while you set up the pocket. Look How at about that. that? Look at that. Teamwork. So we're going to move over to our pocket now. So new workstation. And we're doing... Just like the original piece here, we're doing it in black pigmented MDF. This stuff is sweet. It's, it looks even better when it's finished, too. Yeah, it gets a really nice, rich color. But if you wanted to use just hardwoods for this, um, we've been using the Intense Black from Rubio Monocoat. And one thing that you could do is cut this pocket, pre-finish the pocket with... Uh, this intense black before you glue everything in and then go ahead and glue everything in after the fact and that would give you a really nice hardwood solid black surface they don't call it intense for nothing yeah it is pitch black um so this here we go you see i've already done majority of the cutting i've left one horseshoe for us to come in and do together um, and you can also see that my tape is a little cattywampus right now it's because I cut through so much of it, which is totally okay. It's the purpose of tape. But after a while, I was getting a bad tape reading, so I had to patchwork pieces of tape and get some more dominoes in there to give me a good reading. And we talked about add to scan on the last show, didn't we? We did. But if you're curious about that, um, why don't we point out the tape meter and also where you would add to scan uh, in case folks run into this problem. So tape meter is right up here. It's the domino in the top right corner. And as I move around, it should be solid black. But you can see when I get down here, it starts to go red. In most cases, when that tape meter goes red, it's going to retract the tool. Um, but if you see that red, that's kind of your warning before that happens that you should retract on your own and add more tape wherever you can. For our purposes right now, that's going to be just fine, though, for the rest of it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to pop out this eighth inch bit, get something a little bigger so pocketing goes mm -hmm. faster. Yeah, cool thing about this project is that um, these inlay parts have kind of sharpish corners, but the pocket part itself actually has no sharp corners. It has sharp positive corners, but not sharp uh, convex or uh, concave corner would be the uh, the negative corner, right? Yeah. So no sharp negative corners. So you can clear this out with basically as big of a router bit as will fit. So we've got a big 8 millimeter router bit in here, and that's going to clear this out really nicely. So 8 millimeter done. Automatic Z-touch for that. There we go. And for my cut depth, my material is 1.66. Point one six four. I have on this one. Six four. So what I'm going to do is point one six, which is going to leave my material just ever so slightly proud, because in this instance it's going to be a lot easier to sand 
those down to meet, to have it all be perfectly, perfectly flat than it is the entire surface of this. Mm -hmm. 0.16 on the depth. Yeah, same thing when you're doing box joints as well. You want to make sure that that box joint depth is just a little bit more than the thickness of your material so that you're sanding off just the ends of those box joints, not so that you're sanding down a whole panel to fit the end of the joint that was cut a little bit short. Yep. Um, so this pocket's going to go pretty quickly. I'm going to be all over the place, but I'm just cutting really shallow. So if I'm, it looks like I'm moving fast. It's because I am. Cool. Uh, then we'll come back in, switch it to an inside cut, mm -hmm. and we'll dial in the fit for all these. I'll cut things to zero just so you can see that it's not going to fit, and we'll make it fit after that. Cool. So we're going to go straight from pocket cut to inside cut. Then I'll pause, and then we'll talk about fitment. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's talk about cut types. For the inlay positives, we used an outside cut. That's because we were cutting on the outside of the template line. On this pocket, we're going to end up using an inside cut because we want to cut to the inside of that line. But first, we need to clear out all of this material that's inside that line. Uh, and for that, we use a pocket cut. So what a pocket cut does is it gives you just a little bit of a baked in offset between the template and the pocket itself. And you can see that, Goose, if we go back just to the origin cam here, you wanna see the difference between the blue which has been cut or the gray which has not been cut and that black line. You see the gap between the gray and the black line. That's the pocketing built-in offset. And the reason for that offset is so that you can rough this pocket out just a little bit more aggressively you can also see that as Jake reaches the boundary of that pocket, that that's when Origin's corrective range is kicking in there. So inside the pocket, Origin's gonna work just like a standard plunge router with that spindle locked to the center of its corrective range or locked to the center of the router. But when you reach the boundary of that pocket, it gives you a little bit of a buffer so that you don't go over the edge and accidentally cut into work that you don't wanna cut into. Uh, what we're going to do after this is then go back to an inside cut, which is going to clean up the area between what's been pocketed and the template itself. And that's going to allow Jake to cut this right to size uh, and then even tune the fit a little bit if he needed to. Same as with cutting on the line. If Jake leaves that corrective range accidentally, Origin's going to automatically retract so that it saves his work. And we left basically one horseshoe's worth to clear out here. So you can see kind of how quickly you can chew through this stuff as, as soon as you get comfortable with the way that Origin moves through space. Pretty efficient. I think I'd actually be faster with this than with that trim router like Eric Curtis was doing. What do you think, Jake? I'm getting a nod. Again, with the origin, the gray area uh, always represents the area that's going to be available to cut or that you are going to cut with your router bit. And that's adjustable based on the diameter of router bit that you input. So you'll see when we switch to an inside cut, we have an eight millimeter bit in there. That gray path is going to be exactly eight millimeters wide. Um, and then the blue represents what has been cut. So you can really easily keep track of what you have already cut. To change that cut type, you're just gonna click on that cut type menu button uh, and switch that from pocket to inside. And now Jake's gonna follow around the uncut portions of this horseshoe. And you can see where he's already done the inside cut on the rest of the horseshoe or scroll, if you will. Um, this one has some left to be cut on the inside, but the other two he did in advance. A little cooking show magic. Pause for a little vacuum action. And it can be okay to peel up some tape too as you cut through it, you know. Um, you don't 
necessarily want to get this stuff folded up underneath the router just because it can feel slow and sticky. So if you ever need to take a second to pause and vacuum or peel some tape up, definitely do it because that's the beauty of Origin. It remembers exactly where you were and you can always go right back to it and pick up where you left off. Yeah, and as a reminder, when we're cutting through strips of tape, if a domino is damaged, that means Origin can no longer see it. So this one is almost complete, but it's cut off a little bit there. So it's, it's a it's, dead domino. It's not going to use it. You need a complete white boundary around the whole thing and uh, no cuts through the middle either. Yes. All right. So we just cut this one true to size. So it's exactly the same size as this. And in most cases, those two things won't actually fit together. They need a little bit of wiggle room or they need to be opened up just to actually come together. So I've done that on the rest of this already. But for this one horseshoe, we're going to do kind of a large offset. I'm going to do point zero one two in the negative direction. So that's making that space bigger than it's originally intended to be. Not just bigger, but it means you're removing more material yeah. than you intend. If you're making a tenon, it would actually make the tenon smaller because you're removing more material. So negative is always removing more material. Yeah. Um, and this is why we always encourage test fits if this is like a super high dollar project, like someone's floor or something. You always want to test fit because your fit does depend on a lot of things. It depends on your materials, for example. Yep. Um, harder materials are just not going to want to go together as easily as softer materials. Different materials might spring back a little bit, like foams especially. MDF tends to do this a little bit. And different router bits, even though they say they're one thing, they might be ground a little bit differently. So if you're using off-label router bits, for example, mm -hmm. um, that could have an impact. Yeah. Um, and also this project, there, there are a lot of, how do you say, compounding... Uh, tolerances because you have a lot of pieces that are coming up next to each other. A lot other. of pieces. Yeah, um, 100%. So that inherently is going to require some just like fine tuning as you go through. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Cool. So going to finish this out? Yes. Nice. So you can hear that's cutting a little bit, and it might be hard to see on your screen, but you can see how that blue now is extending just past the black boundary, if you will, of the cut template. And that's because Jake used a negative offset. Negative offsets in Origin World mean that you are removing extra material. So since we're removing material from the inside of this pocket, it's actually going to make the pocket bigger. It would also make a mortise bigger, for example. Um, a tenon, if you used a negative offset, it would make that tenon smaller because you're cutting on the outside, not the inside of the tenon. And, um, you know, when you're cutting on the outside of something and you remove extra material, it makes it smaller. Simple science. Um, this is where the blue area that has already been cut being visible uh, comes in really handy. So we already cut two of these horseshoes, and you know what's been cut compared to not because it's not blue. So Jake's going in and filling in all those blue areas, and then we'll go see how this fits.
Okay, I'm trying to be helpful over here. There we go. This dust is uh, something special. Yeah, good thing I'm wearing all black everything. <laughs> all right. Going to get all the shaper tape off. At least these ones. Yeah, There's... again, these weren't doing anything for you anymore. So uh, you could always still come back to this. You could always still add to scan. Also, if you wanted to come back to this and add even more tape. Uh, but once you cut through those dominoes, they're not really doing anything for you anymore. But on the same, at the same time, that's okay. That's what it's meant to be used for, mm -hmm. is to be cut through. That's why it's soft. That's why it's not uh, shaper aluminum rulers. <laughs> That'd be something. Oh, that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> you cut through aluminum. It'd be hard, though. All right. Do you remember how this goes together? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have an idea. Okay. I'm cool. more trying to decide what color I want where. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see that one's just fallen perfectly into place. Nice. Oh. That means this is going to go over here. And this one meets there. Perfection. And I can already tell that 0.01 was just enough to kind of give you a little more room right gave there. Gave me a little bit of room, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's do walnut here. Wow. That's snug. Nice and creaky. That point oh one makes sense because that's an interface between two parts, and you did point oh one two on the pocket. 0 0.012 was what you needed for the pocket to fit. Yep. And so you probably could have even gone 0 0.012 on those secondary interfaces, right? Probably. Just kind of carrying that over. Yeah. Here, you want this, um, got a piece of wood over here for you to use for that mallet, if you'd like. I like. This one's giving me a little trouble. Okay. <laughs> come on buddy all right we'll come back to him here you know what why don't you give me that one and i'll try to sand a little chamfer underneath and the uh sanding stick if you would oh i've got it right here nice Ooh, careful with this this is two parts now but it's two clean parts two very clean parts <laughs> two clean parts <laughs> There's no kerf if you just break something in half. Bam. Okay, right. so you're just waiting on this one piece, huh? Well, I have the perimeter, too. Oh, you do have the perimeter. Okay. The perimeter's a fun one. It's just a bunch of arches. Um, but they come together in a very nice way. I actually... I did a small offset on the outside line and a slightly larger offset on the inside line to kind of keep things tight and keep those seams tight. That's a nice squeaky fit. Here, you can see if this one goes in. Super happy with that. Here, try this one, and then I got the second piece for you here. Snap. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. <laughs> Gonna hit it again. Here. Give it a little support. We all need support sometimes, yep. folks. Oh, I wanted to go. Eh? Pretty close. It wouldn't be a live show if we didn't need the mallet occasionally. Yeah. But of course it all compounds into the last one. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
I almost had it. Okay, let me take a little more off of that uh, that straight edge. Just a little bit. And Thanks. then I think it'll come together. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jakey. That's okay. <laughs> I think I just made it easier, actually. <laughs> so here, go ahead and pop this one in. This is uh, this is why you want to pay attention to grain direction, folks. Perfect. Okay, here you go. Oops. Oh no. Hey. -oh. Wrong way. Eh? Almost? Oops. Yeah, watch your fingers. Hey! Voila! <laughs> nothing. Mike, nothing. <laughs> I would tune the fit on that one just a little bit more next yeah. time. But of course, it's you know, close. I did cut this one beforehand. And that was the one that you cut beforehand. You cut that one beforehand, and then we cut the two like blonde ones later. Yep. Chalk that one up to learning. That's why I always do a test fit. Exactly. But that is awesome. Um, those aren't going to come out now, so... <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's a dry fit. We'll hang that on the wall. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to show you a couple projects on Shaper Hub, thinking about, hey, how do I get these projects on my router? Um, what if I want to try this at home? Okay, so let's pop over to the screen over here. This is what you're going to look for, and Ted's got links to these. But uh, if you want to come back to this, this is scroll floor inlay. You could search for that. And this has all of those project files in here. To sync that to your router, you're just going to hit sync to my files and successfully added to my files. I'm signed up on a different account as Jake right now. So we've got that one. Another one that's gonna be really fun, I would recommend thinner commercial veneers with this. And this is the project that we have this whole show on with Ramon. This is his Shiprock inlay. See, by Ramon Art right here. And um, I mean, look at the pieces for this thing. That is cool as heck. And then you can do a bunch of different colors. So like this is one kind of scene that you could put together. Going from daytime to nighttime here. And then this is the one that we did on the show at Shaper HQ. So man, um, you can really just have fun with the wood species on this one. And then last but not least, we've got this project by Michael Burt. Um, and when you're thinking about techniques, so one thing that we didn't show today was the idea of actually putting inlay pieces in and then coming back and recutting them. So if you look at this project on the screen here, this is actually um, a bunch of identical pieces. They're laid in basically one column or one row at a time. And then what Michael does is he actually cuts into the pieces as he uh, is inlaying them. And I think that that's a really cool technique because it allows you to batch out these positives in a way where you can do just a couple at a time. Um, you don't have to actually tune the fit of every single one like we did at this show and kind of uh, hope that it all comes together in the end. You're actually cutting to fit exactly every single time you inlay a new row or column on that. So I think that's super cool. Yeah. And that's under Veneer Parquetry Feather. I think that's a sweet project. So thanks for sharing that. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and roll into the Q&A. Right on. Let's if, do it. Yeah, if anybody is watching this on YouTube, for the people who are watching this on YouTube in the future, uh, check us out live next time. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. We'll see you in two weeks. Yeah.